welcome to today's webinar, The Business Justification Needed to Accelerate Your Digital Transformation, brought to you by Clarison and by Colmy Group. In unsettled times like these, businesses that thrive are supported by an effective project and portfolio management solution that provides them with the visibility, productivity, and adoptability they need to proactively address unexpected threats and opportunities. We're seeing an increased focus on digital transformation, cost reduction, and data-driven business decisions. And that's where a strong tool will help your organization shine. Today, we'll be hearing from two experts in PMO leadership and PPM selection and implementation, Kim Essendroop and Matt Henderson, founders here at Colmy Group. They'll be covering gaining investment from your stakeholders and within your company as a whole, the various benefits of a good PPM software, and how to tailor your message to specific business units. And at the end, we'll touch a little bit on actually building the business case. And if you look in the description, you'll see a link to download our free one pager on building your business case, which is a cheat sheet of the tools that Kim and Matt use themselves when helping clients build their case. Thanks, Lori. We're really excited to talk about this topic today. And speaking of exciting, if you hang around to the end of the webinar, we have some free tools we're going to share to help you get started on your business case. So stick around. Yes. And uh, today we've got so much content we want to hit on. Apologies if we go a little bit fast. We just want to share as much information as we can with you in the limited time that we've got. And we'll share with you at the end of the webinar how you can reach out, reach out to us directly if we don't cover your specific question uh, or if you'd like to dig down deeper into any of our topics today. Thanks, Kim. Now, assuming you're already committed to getting Clarison, the first step in figuring out your justification messaging is to understand how your organization invests in new technology. That's right. And some people might hesitate to invest in a new tool or new technology if they've already got an existing tool because they think we've already got so much money sunk into the existing tool. Yeah, I've had clients who are using a tool for years and initially felt like going to a new tool wasn't worth it, even though their existing tool really didn't fit the bill anymore. You got to think about it, putting good money after bad money after bad won't make you more efficient. You need to start with who improves the investment? Is it a committee? If so, who is on it? Right. And it's, yeah, it's really stopping and saying, how do you get approval for funding to get the tools you need to help with your business? So you also need to look at what's the process. Do you have a formal submission process uh, or is it more ad hoc? And some organizations are shifting from maybe an annual cycle to a quarterly funding cycle to support organizational agility. Um, and so I guess the first step is really spend, do a little homework if you haven't already and look in your organization and just start asking the questions. How do we get funding for important business? business tools or uh, technology transformations that can help us operate more efficiently. And then on top of that, you have to also think, how is this committee or how is this group body that approves funding, how do they measure success? And, and factor that into your selection criteria to make sure that your solution collects the data that they're looking for. Along with understanding how do they decide what to invest in and what criteria do they use? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you have to spend some time saying, how do you select your investment and, and really doing some homework on that. Um, but on top of that, it's really good to ask the question, what does your organization deliber deliberately not invest in? Maybe they have some hot button items or topics that they like to try to stay away from. So it's good to incorporate that research when you're looking into how do you justify your investment so you can steer clear of that. And when you're thinking about this, think more of a macro level, not just your top three current problems or issues today, but what could be impactful in the future? What do you need to think about um, that's going to come down the pipeline? Yeah, and as you start these conversations with this committee, this selection group, whether it's one person or a committee, and you start to get engaged with them and start to understand the process, it's really good to start building relationships with those. And we say this is really important when you start to uh, engage in this funding process because it can be a long road, but it, one of the important aspects of that is building the relationships. And so we highly recommend when you talk to these stakeholders, to this selection committee, or those that have influence on funding, is to spend time, invest time with them. That's the first investment you need to make. Take them out to coffee, spend some one-on-one -on -one time and get to know them and ask them questions like, what do you look for when you are doing investments? When we have a technology transformation, what are some things I need to think about as I'm putting my business case together that's going to make that more interesting or make it help, help the uh, governing committee or funding committee understand that and maybe buy into it? 
What I found is successful is to launch a grassroots marketing campaign. So talk to your manager and colleagues and other influential people uh, that you work with or in your organization and get their buy-in quickly and count on them to help use their influence to help spread the word. You know, evangelize uh, what you're doing with your Clarison solution and the benefits that you see that Clarison is going to bring to your organization. You know, this kind of grassroots marketing campaign, campaign along with a strong business case will definitely set you up for success. Oh, definitely. Yeah, you can't, you can't, however good your business case is, if you walk into a conference room for the first time with your executive committee or whoever does the funding and say, look, I've got these slides and a great idea, you might already be shooting yourself in the foot if you haven't built the relationships, if you don't understand how they select and prioritize investment, if you haven't created a grassroots campaign and already have support from, from strong um, stakeholders across the organization. But if you walk in with all that support and all that knowledge and ready to have that conversation, and especially if the body that you're speaking with is already familiar with your business case, you stand a much, much better chance of success than if you just exactly. come in cold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the other things that we talked a little bit earlier are this, the criteria that they use to select an investment. And some organizations are more mature in this than others. So this is part of your discovery. But start asking questions. How do you how do you look at investments and prioritize them? Because there's unlimited things you can do, but of course, limited funding. So some things to ask about are, are they are they focused on strategic alignment? Um, of projects. So do you, uh, do you have a, a priority of making sure that all your projects are aligned to your, your corporate strategy? Is getting your products, your time to market, is that a really key priority? And then you can look at, well, how can it, uh, Claire is and help me do that. What about profit or revenue? If I'm a services organization, maybe that's a key metric I need to build into my business case. Uh, cost, return on investment, or benefits tracking. These are all really key metrics as well. And if you can start to provide these with this uh, with Clarison, that really helps build the business case. We can also look at things like risk, or especially if you're a compliance driven organization, you're, you've got HIPAA requirements or PCI or things like that. Um, the ability for Clarison to meet those requirements can be really, really key um, for your executive team. Managing your resource and your capacity uh, for, for, for your resources to staff and deliver on projects is really key, especially if that area has been problematic for you. Customer satisfaction is another key uh, criteria you might look at. And also, employee satisfaction can be just as important or even more important in an environment where employee retention is, is becoming more key all the time. Yeah, it's really critical to know what your leaders are looking for because uh, this will set you up to know how to sell them on the right features. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Now, here's, an, here's, a, here's a, a situation that we see sometimes, Matt, is what happens if you're in a tough spot because your organization has tried this before. You've tried to do a PPM and maybe it failed. How do you address that? Uh, well, the best thing to do is learn from the past. So if you've had a PPM implementation or similar software as a service system like Time Entry that was successful or wasn't successful, do some research and identify all the lessons learned you can. Uh, Comey recommends that you look especially at the change management processes used for the previous implementation. You know, what worked and do what didn't work, what got people on board uh, and got people excited for the change. Yeah, and I, I really like the idea, Matt, is really, as you kind of do a little uh, post-mortem on any previous implementations, look at how they approached organizational change management. Um, we've built a practice to focus on this in particular because we've seen that this is very often the make or break of solutions. You might have a great solution out there, mm -hmm. PPM or otherwise, and if you can't get your organization to use it, uh, it's it's it's, yeah, it's not going to benefit you much. <laughs> yeah, what's the use? And so, really focus on those OCM aspects. And when you write your new business case or talk about justifying your new implementation, it might be good to really highlight. Well, this is what went wrong previously, and this is how we're going to make sure that our next implementation is going to be successful. Yeah, as you go through the process looking at Clarison, you're going to have to understand or justify why your implementation will be successful. So, look at the past successful business cases. Note how they make their case how they justify the investment, and how they describe the benefits and returns. You talk to the people involved in those past investments, get their advice, get their, you know, again, best practices, lessons learned. You know, also ask Clarison, you know, ask us. We have case studies, we have customer references to, to talk to potentially that have a similar use case that you are looking for for your implementation. Yeah, it's nice to say, well, hey, we think we can succeed with Clarison because you know, here's some reference of some other larger key clients who were very successful with Clarison as well. And mm -hmm. through all of this, by demonstrating that you're thinking critical, critically, 
using good data uh, can help rebuild trust with your leaders if they're a little gun shy and maybe are, maybe you're a little hesitant to invest. You can also expand that search of past business cases and look at other business cases, maybe in related technologies that that succeeded. And you can get those business cases, look through them, see how they made their successful justification for investment, and maybe borrow from some of those and talk to those team members who put those business cases in front because they may have some very useful tips and tricks for you. And it's also really important, don't, don't just reuse those business cases, um, but definitely see what you can take from lessons learned and, and, um, and use those for your own business case. Great. Um, now, as you start to investigate how PPM uh, or Clarison can benefit your organization, the best place to start is the top, looking at the strategic benefits that PPM can provide. We're going to go into detail on four key strategic benefits. Uh, first, project alignment of strategy, organizational agility, resource alignment, and automa automation and simplification. And Kim, you're going to kick us off for project alignment strategy. Yes, I love this conversation. Uh, and this is really key. As we said, we're going to start at the top. We're going to start having a strategic conversation, look at strategic uh, justifications that kind of work our way down the more tactical things. But um, getting alignment with strategy is really, really important. And sometimes from a project delivery standpoint, we lose sight of that because we're so focused on delivery that we lose sight of how important it is to get that alignment. Uh, for example, for a recent engagement we did, we assisted the client when they did an analysis and put together an approach for implementing our, their, their, their PPM tool. And in our analysis, we found that the client had nearly one initiative um, for every two employees in their organization. So they had projects all over the place. And not only that, we found out that 75% of the projects they had on the books were not even aligned to the strategic priority. So three quarters of the work they were trying to get done didn't align with what they really needed to get done as an organization. And through that organization, we identified two key focus areas for their PPM. One, prioritize any in incoming work to so make sure that you're driving strategic priorities. And secondly, ensure that selected initiatives are, of course, successfully implemented. And so, um, of course, projects that are not aligned to strategic priorities are not only wasting resources, but they're impeding your ability as an organization to be agile and meet your objectives. And so this is one thing that we you know, particularly love about Clarison is it really gives you that ability to very easily manage that intake, control that funnel and prioritize that work and put eyes on that prioritization and, and gives you a, a way to engage your executive team in selecting um, your projects and really help them under, not only uh, give them a role in that, but also help them understand how important it is to stay actively engaged in that process. And so a good tool is going to help you control that intake, and it's also going to force deliberate evaluation of your capital investment and your resources, um, how you're going to implement those across your projects. And strategic alignment, these are the, this is something that we really want to focus on. If you, um, are, if you find that your organization is doing a lot of work that doesn't align with strategic initiatives, then calling this out as a value can be huge. Um, a key selling phrase that we listen for for this kind of a kind of a priority justification is that um, if I hear executives saying things like we don't we don't know if our work is aligned to strategy or we somehow can't get our strategic initiatives done. If you hear that kind of talk when you engage with your investment team or your stakeholders, then maybe focus a lot of your, your business case on getting work aligned to strategy. Great. <clears throat> So looking at organizational agility, it's really important for you to understand, be able to have the ability to reprioritize and shift focus as your organizational priorities change. You know, looking at being able to keep resources focused on current priorities, but also looking at potential, again, new priorities that are, are important for your organization. You know, understand the impact to the portfolio and changing priorities. For example, if you do this, how does this impact other priorities or other work we have going on? To really achieve organizational agility, you need software agility. You know, Clarison is a great that allows you to build your custom business process into Clarison. So Clarison works the way you work versus the way, versus a lot of tools where you work the way the tool works. Um, and then really uh, refining and expand upon those business processes as needed in the future. So basically you start with business processes you build upon as things may change in your organization. And you know, Clarison is very configurable to support that. And what's also great about it is each team can have their own dynamic processes to support their own needs, right? So they don't have to have, you don't have to have one set of processes or templates in Clarison and that's supposed to support other groups or your entire organization. It's very configurable that you can support uh, teams with their unique needs. 
um, you know, looking at this is again, this this is for your organization. If you are keep seeing yourself playing a shell game of resources, moving them from one project to another, or moving them from business as usual work to strategic initiatives when you get a call from your executive. You know, having new projects land on your, your plate that have to be done now, and you don't know how that impacts the rest of your portfolio, or you don't know how to communicate how that impacts the rest of your portfolio to either push back or understand uh, the impact it's going to have to what's happening currently to your, the, that, that executive. And so really, um, you know, understand the impact of new work as it comes down uh, and understanding how to prioritize it is a great capability that you're going to get from Claris and to really make sure you can optimize your budget, your resources, be able to um, and, and to challenge to take on those challenges, new opportunities as there are new um, projects or initiatives as they come down the pipe. Yeah, I really like that one, Matt, because as anybody who's run a PMO or a portfolio knows, things are going to happen and you're going to get that uh, executive ask or that new priority that says, hey, we have to squeeze this new project in. Right. And most of us, with, without a strong tool like Clarison, we, we just have to say, OK, or maybe we push back. We don't have the critical data that's needed to make a sound business decision. And with Clarison, you're able to say, OK, if I do this, if I put this project in, I can do that. But here are the impacts to the other three things that you told me were a priority. So I love that. I love that capability as a, as a and as you a have empirical and visual leader. data that you can present and say, don't you don't have to trust me. Right. Let's look at the data in the system. And this is what the, the impact is going to be. It becomes less a personal pushback, and now you've got data-driven exactly. decision-making, which is what I love about this. Yeah. Um, another area that I love to talk about in the strategic context is resource alignment. And as we all know, internal resources, you, your, your people, they're, it's a finite resource, but the work demand on them is practically infinite, really. So you ha always have to do some kind of a prioritization exercise, and to do that, you need a, need a strong tool. Uh, you can also use a clue, like you can also use Clarison to not just uh, manage your resource pools overall, but identify specific skills gaps or skills bottlenecks that are preventing you from getting work done, and manage your resource levels so your resources aren't over allocated or, or under allocated. It ensures that you're scaled and skilled uh, enough to meet the needs of organization and your incoming you know, volume of work. And this is the thing you really want to talk to in your organization if you keep hitting choke points or those bottlenecks where you've got a few skills or a few key resources that seem to always be over allocated, always have too much to go going on. And those are really the, the kind of the bottlenecks for getting key projects done. Also, a key phrase that we listen for is, I feel like my people are always busy but I don't know what they're doing, or I can't justify more headcount. Those are phrases we listen to and think that is a problem with resource management, something we can solve uh, with Clarison. Key selling phrases we want to talk about is our visibility. Say, well, we can give you the ability to view what your people are working on, uh, what capacity that they're at, justify new headcount or new skills if you need it, and help you make sure that you've got resource level, you've got the right resources to match the work that you need to get done in the organization. Great. And lastly, we're talking about automation and simplification. You know, overall simplification of your complex systems by consolidating a central tool um, is, is greatly beneficial. Instead of using multiple tools like spreadsheets, uh, PowerPoint, uh, and then manual processes, uh, your organization can work and report from a single source of truth in Clarison, which provides obvious benefits, but may be hard to quantify. You know, if you look at um, a tool like Claris and you, know, you can generate a status report like literally a click. So if you if your organization takes more than a minute to generate a status report, <clears throat> you're wasting time. Those resources can be doing other things, it can be working with clients, working with your internal or external stakeholders. Uh, it can be using that time more valuably than trying to you know copy and paste things from Excel or a different tool into PowerPoint to present your status to your your executives. So here, key selling phases include you know if you look at complex decentralized or manual processes. So, you know, multiple spreadsheets, multiple tools that you're using, there's often the chance of error, right? You transpose numbers can taking it from SAP to a, an Excel spreadsheet, for example, really reducing the value of data to your organization. So the last thing you want to do is present, you know, uh, budget data or forecast data up to your executive and it's, it's wrong, right? Then you have to kind of go back on it. And with Claris, and since it has the centralized data and central point of truth, the data is there and it's, it's valuable because it's more, um, more accurate. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And and in fact, if you step back, this idea of consolidating, 
tools. You, you've got uh, complex, you've got all these different tools. Just that idea of consolidating can be very, very um, compelling when you present it correctly to your investment committee or your investors. And what we recommend is something that we call spaghetti bowl diagram. It sounds kind of funny, um, but the spaghetti bowl diagram is one that can show visually very clearly the impact of automation and simplification, especially if those are key to your business case. It's an easy way to illustrate the strategic benefits that might otherwise might be a really detailed and technical conversation. Um, and so the way this works is here. I'm going to show you the slide here. So we've got um, we've got finance and and resource managers and project managers, and we know finance uses our ERP system and the CRM uh, and uh, vendor management systems. And you know we've got other systems that are involved. We've got team collaboration and master project dashboard used by resource managers. And we start just mapping them out like this. And you start drawing the interactions and how they all tie together. And we start looking at what does a project manager have to do? Well, they have to do project plans. They've got to do project budgets. They've got SAS reports. And somewhere in there, we've also got resource alignments. And somehow, all this stuff has to connect together. And all these pieces need to move around. And honestly, a lot of these places, these interactions are manual. I've got a lot Log into data. If I'm a project manager, I'm copying, pasting, and it just you can see pretty soon it turns into this big bowl of spaghetti of interactions made by humans, and you, know, you throw collaboration on top of that between those three parties, and it becomes a mess. And, and just so to know, the this diagram isn't just for this isn't just a, a diagram just for this presentation. This is basically a representation of a real client environment that we that we worked with. Yeah, and actually, I'll even add, this is actually a simplified version of a spaghetti bowl, the last spaghetti bowl diagram that we did. So you can I mean, put yourself in that. We're, we're talking about three resources. You've got team members also. You've got, um, um, you've got, we've got resource managers here, but what about team leads? What about executives? I mean, you stack those on, and this, this diagram turns into madness, and it really is good at conveying how crazy the environment is. So let's look at what a spaghetti bowl, let's look at this diagram like the after picture that we want to show. So, of course, we still got finance project managers and resource managers in our ERP, CRM, and vendor management. All those interactions are there. But all those other bubbles, all those lines, they all get consolidated into Clarison. And so what we want to so what this diagram is really good at illustrating is really the operational chaos that those of us on, you know, with feet on the street have to deal with on a daily basis and communicates that to the executive team and says, look, we're simplifying everybody's life. And just intuitively, we find that everybody understands this kind of diagram. They say, OK, we're going to make things simpler. We're going to reduce that overhead. Um, and that's what we're trying to do here. So we love this diagram. And it's kind of our, our uh, pro tip to you, our audience, to put together a tip like this if you're moving from that kind of chaotic multi-tool environment to a consolidated one. Yeah, thanks, Ken. That, that, tool, I, that, that, uh, that tool is great for executives. That oftentimes, you know, pops up the eye-opening moment, right? So uh, it's very useful. So jumping to the next section, we're going to talk about hard savings. <clears throat> so hard cost savings are the most valuable and demonstrable uh, if you can identify them. These are quantifiable cost savings that you can directly use to offset the cost of your Clarison investment. Often these are hard to come by. Many benefits are strategic or soft. Furthermore, some of the hard costs require assumptions and calculations which you must, which you must make sure you have a line of your investment team. We're going to go into detail of five key hard savings. Uh, first, elimination of other systems, improved project budget management, improved resource utilization, time to market, and delivery quality. So looking at elimination of other systems, um, you potentially have the ability to reduce costs by eliminating other tools. Uh, licensing and support costs. These other tools could be project or financial management tools, time entry, reporting, integration, middleware, uh, including hardware. Uh, it's important to also, though, be aware of contract termination clauses. Some some will have deadlines that may or may not line up nicely with your annual investment cycle. And there also may be termination fees. Um, these are costs that are uh, really important for you to understand. And lastly, there may be costs for actually getting your data out of the existing systems that you use. Also be aware of potential migration costs or transitioning tools. Um, you know, we've had a a customer that actually uh, had a great use case because they were able to use a custom object within Clarison, which is basically a custom module that you can configure in the system that was able to track metadata that they, that they were tracking another tools before, which allowed them to elim eliminate the old legacy system that was costing them 100,000 year, a year to maintain. So because they're able to use the custom uh, configuration in Clarison, they're able to really significantly not, even, not only reduce tools, but also reduce cost organization. 
Yeah, you know, I, I really like this one, and this should be your first stop after you get through your strategic analysis of, of uh, justification, uh, sit down and make a list of all the tools that your team uses and just go through them top to bottom and say, can I get rid of this? Can I get rid of this in Clarison? Can I get rid of this in Clarison? And how much would that save? And what's great about Clarison is for, for eliminating extraneous tools is that there are this custom object functionality. And I won't go in too much into it right now, but you have the ability to basically create different objects that sometimes you wouldn't always associate with a PPM tool, but integrate into managing projects, objects that can be used for product catalogs, bill of materials, and things like that. And so that can result in huge savings by getting rid of other systems and simplifying your environment by putting it all in one place. Yep, thanks, Kim. The next one's improved project budget management. So looking at being able to justify your savings by providing better management of project costs. For example, if we can save X percent of the capital budget, what is that worth to the organization? If you can cite current deviations from your from existing budgets, project budgets, you know what's the what's the plan budget, what's the actual costs. If you can import actual project cost data from external sources, this will provide the best data tracking for tracking and accuracy. Again, it's very important that you must get alignment with your investment team or financial team on what savings they find credible um, for your business case. I think Kim, you have a good story on this. Um, oh, yeah, regarding, uh, yeah, so budget management can be really important. So, and um, you can really get a lot more accurate in how you manage that. So, one, one case story I like to share is that um, I worked with one organization where they liked Claris and they wanted to implement it, but their finance team really wasn't totally bought into it. They weren't confident that Claris could manage the budgets just because. Uh, I'm not sure why, honestly, but they had another tool that they were using at the time. And so we ran in parallel for an entire quarter, their old tool and Clarison. And at the end of the quarter, we found out that um, Clarison detected and through our implementation, we found that they had some teams that were misallocating capital budget costs uh, between 30 and 40%. Um, so it was really dramatic and it was really cool. And it was a nice demonstration that uh, a, str a strong centralized tool like Clarison can give you a lot of power when it comes to budget management and budget tracking. No, that's a great use case. So coming up next, we're talking about improved resource utilization. <clears throat> so again, an analysis for a customer building a case for a PPM tool showed that their project manager spent over 20% of their time uh, updating the spreadsheets, creating PowerPoint presentations, and really updating the same information over and over in different tools. So you're looking at a tool like Clarison, really reducing that administrative, as we call it, getting real work, uh, more real work done. Um, especially if you're uh, a service organization, for example, and you charge for resource types of projects, a PPM tool can really help you improve billable utilization. You know, think about uh, X increase in, uh, in utilization, how much revenue increases that to your organization. But also, it's important to be a bit conservative, conservative here, because as people use a new tool, it takes a little bit of time for them to really, you know, optimize how they use that tool, right? So, you're actually your utilization or your administrative utilization may actually increase at first, um, but should you know improve over time, where they're actually getting the benefits of the tool uh, of Clarison and really uh, again able to use their time in more important ways. And can you also yeah, have a story that's a, yeah, that's a pro tip is when you start citing statistics, you start citing numbers, things like replacing other other tools, that's pretty hard. The numbers are pretty hard. When we start trying to estimate uh, savings, like things like employ, uh, improved resource utilization, expect that your um, audience might be a little skeptical of the numbers, so be ready to back them up and provide some transparency into how you came up with those. Just expect that question, how did you come up with that savings? Uh, be ready to back it up and be conservative in that and even say, look, I think we can save 20%, but I'm in this business case, I'm only calculating a savings of 10% to be conservative. And yeah, on this one in particular, uh, we implemented Clarison for an organization as a, as a, a, a pan-European uh, service delivery organization. And, um, you know, for, and there were professional services. And if you're in professional services, you know your organization basically lives and dies by your resource utilization number. And we found that after six months we implemented, they improved their billable utilization uh, on on average for the organization by 20%. 
which is huge, and that easily translates into hard dollars. Another organization we recently implemented, there was one team in particular that went from an average billable utilization of 12%, and they were able to look at what was going on, where people were not being used or where they were being used, what skills were they, and they bumped their utilization up to 27%. And so, and those numbers can easily transfer into hard, hard money, which can um, be used to justify the investment. Great, thanks, Kim. Uh, so, two more hard costs we want to look at. Uh, first one is time market. So, this is especially for research and design or product development use use cases, where you can use Claris and really demonstrate a faster time to market. This really works for you if you can quantify value as speeding time to market, for example. Uh, if you can say every month we delay, we lose X percent market share or miss out on X percent revenue. Yeah, and, and organizations that use that metric, they're very attentive to that metric. So that's a really Definitely powerful yeah. one. Yeah. Right. And the last one is we have delivery quality. Um, some organizations can quantify the financial impacts of poor quality. Um, consider this for your organization if you provide any kind of warranty of the work you've done. If that warranty work uh, is a hard cost that reduces the profitability of your project, um, you know, that, that obviously can have a major impact to uh, the, the profitability of the projects you're working on. Yeah, and that works especially well if you're in an organization where your your audience are really, uh, they feel the pain of, of, of executive escalations for project problems, uh, or they feel the pain when projects don't come in well, then it might be good in those cases to really highlight what you can do from a quality perspective. Exactly. So we're at the end of hard cost savings. You know they can be difficult to identify, but very uh, impactful and, and, res and can resonate really well with your leaders. So it's really uh, important to look at those. So Kim, you're, you're going to talk to us next about soft savings, right? I am, and soft savings um, can be hard to quantify sometimes. But if you can get it right, if you can do it right and get alignment with your team where they buy into your 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 plan for soft savings, it can provide very real benefits for your investment for your organization. And just some of the things we're going to run through are things like uh, time savings through efficiencies, context switching, project success, data accuracy, and a couple others. But as we go through these, it's really important to be realistic about your your, your soft costs. Um, the co and really also think about what are the costs of doing nothing uh, what are the impacts of the indirect cost of each of the topics we're going to talk through next? Uh, and these can be things like inefficiencies in your organization um, and opportunity savings that, that you could be reaping. But let's start off talking about cost savings through efficiency. So uh, this one's pretty straightforward from a math perspective, maybe a little more involved in, in uh, justifying to your audience. So the idea here is you're gaining efficiency. So for example, I'm reducing the time it takes for each project manager to do status reports uh, by 15 minutes per week. Maybe that's going to be my estimate. So if I say that's my savings, I'm going to take 15 minutes times the number of projects times the number of weeks. That equals a time saved per year. And then multiply that by what the average person costs, right? So when you start doing that math, you can come up with really big and significant numbers. And this is why you've got to really get alignment with your investment team on how they quantify labor savings. And the reason I say this is because some organizations don't recognize savings in labor. They don't recognize it's actually a, a benefit unless you're able to reduce headcount. And maybe we don't actually want to do that. So what you have to do is kind of flip that around if that's the case and say, well, that save time um, is something that I can use to invest more in my projects to drive more project success. I can save this much time so of, of nonsense of administrivia so I can focus on real leadership in the organization. Um, and so you've got a, or another way that you can demonstrate value out of this, is, which is actually pretty easy, is if you're a professional services delivery organization, you can translate that into billable time to say, look, I've got this many you know, man hours or person hours per year that I'm going to save doing administrative and turn it into value, value added billable work, in which case the numbers can look pretty strong. And even if you already are billing for some of that time, I think everybody should like the idea of taking that time you're spending crunching numbers and copying and pasting out of spreadsheets into value given to the customer is something that is a win for everybody involved. But bottom line here is if you're going to try to declare savings by efficiencies, make sure that you have alignment with your uh, the funding team on how they're going to recognize that. And otherwise, they're going to pick your business case apart in that area. Another area we can talk about is context switching. And I think this is something we're all familiar with these days is using multiple 
their processes uh, produces a lot of impacts of context switching. I have to, uh, it's it's a loss of focus by multitasking. I'm going from this one, I'm jumping over to my emails, I'm having a conversation online, and all those things distract from getting things done, and they don't make me feel like I've been accomplished uh, as a resource today. In fact, a study by Carnegie Mellon University found that most people average only three minutes on any given task and only two minutes on a digital tool before switching either voluntarily or involuntarily. And the amount of time that you need for context switching or that you can save on from context switching requires an operational overhead of like 20%, maybe even higher for a person to figure out where they left off or where they need to be done, where they need to go next. So that's um, kind of a big number. But if you think about it, every time you switch between apps, I switch between this and that, it's time lost, it's focus lost, and it's, it's lost money. And those efforts can be hard to, to quantify and justify, but they're also very, very real. And Matt, I think you've got a story on this one, right? Yeah, a pretty personal story. So for an organization that I worked with in the past, a service organization, we did some analysis on what the project managers did on a daily basis. And we found out that basically 28% of their time was spent on uh, administrivia and impacted by context switching because they had so many tools that they did deal with uh, and update, and then so many manual processes they did do as well as part of the job. So they had um, internal facing documents like budgets and staff reports and external facing documents like product budgets and staff reports. And so we we're spending so much time on these different tools and, you know, copying, pasting data, manipulating data. It just, it, it was a significant part of their week. And so using a tool like Clarison reduced that time to single digits. It was just remarkable, the, 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 the difference. And, and that only not only made our data better, uh, made the, the project managers more efficient, but also made the project managers a lot happier. Yes, everybody likes happy project managers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's talk now a little bit about project success. And sometimes project success and the benefit of that can be a little hard to quantify. Maybe it's easy to quantify in your organization. Um, one of the things that we've done is uh, kind of to investigate the impacts of project success is we did a survey in 2018. Uh, it was a, a survey on PPM data consumption. And we did it at the 2018 PMO Symposium where we talked to um, 65 project uh, PMO and portfolio leaders across different industries and different geographies. And we posed several questions to quantify project success. Um, instead of instead of asking, are your projects successful or are they not, we wanted to get a little more quantitative. We wanted to get some more data and try to try to dig into you know, what kinds of things in the a PPM tool can help you be more successful with your projects. And when we talked about the benefits and savings, um, what we want to do is focus on measurable improvements like, you know, delivery to scope, delivery to timeline, expected value or revenue and things like that. In addition, we want to see, you know, how close were you on your projects and so on. And um, so, and also how frequently do you have to address project issues or do your firefighting? And one of the most striking things that came out of our study was we found that across Every single measure of success, including scope, schedule, cost, quality, all these things, customer satisfaction, the ability to efficiently close a project, organizations which track and report on project financials are better off on every one of those measures of success than those that don't. Simply the act of tracking project financials in a tool like Clarison. And so uh, we've got a study. Uh, we'll give you the link. You can download it. But something like this may also be a big help for you when you justify to say, look, uh, and this is if you're not already tracking project budgets or if you're not tracking budgets very well at the project level and aggregating that to the, the portfolio level. If you don't see what your forecast is for every project for your portfolio and what your actuals are to date and which projects are going off track, you're at risk. And so we've got this study. We'll make it available to you and it may help you. We've got some nice slides and some data in there uh, that you can maybe pull into your business case to help justify it based on the grounds that, look, we found that we can make our projects more successful if we can implement tools that give us this. So maybe something that can help you with your justification. And one last, another item here was uh, data accuracy. So key to the ability to reprioritize and shift focuses as organizational parties change, um, you can add automation gov and adding governance in here, uh, give you more accurate project data. So if you can't rely on the project data to make decisions, then how good is this tool for you overall? How can you manage your portfolio? And that data gets more accurate when it's centralized in one place in one tool like Clarison. Otherwise, you know, you know the drill. It's it's in emails and some spreadsheets and this other shared document out somewhere. Pulling that data together lets you provide 
validation, automation, validate the integrity, and makes you really most importantly helps provide uh, intelligent decision making that your team and your executive team can rely on. And so the, just saying, I've got the ability to centralize this data and more accurate so you can make good business decisions on it. It's a soft, it's a it's kind of a soft benefit, but it's incredibly valuable. Um, and you can even extend this uh, idea of centralized data with a, one of the great things about Clarison is it gives you the ability to connect with external resources. So it's not just your 25 spreadsheets you've got floating around your organization. It's the spreadsheets that are in your partner organizations or your customers' organizations if you deal with external partners or external clients. You can bring all that centrally and have everybody collaborate on the same project, see the same data at the same time. And that's incredibly valuable for making sure that you've got good decisions and great communication across the organization, which takes me to my next concept, which is data transparency is having that ability to say, look, if you let me invest in this, I'm going to give you full data transparency anytime you want to, executives, resource managers, team leads, team members, customers, partners, you can log in and see exactly what's going on with the project exactly any minute you want to and go on. Flying blind is something we see way too much, and it's a pet peeve of management. And so if that's something you struggle with, keywords of data accuracy, data transparency are things that can probably take you a long way. Um, should we talk about lessons learned, Matt? Sure. Uh, PPM can really provide a structured method for capturing lessons learned and improving. You know, not all uh, PPM tools are set up to do this. Uh, if you use this justification, make sure the lessons learned uh, evaluation are part of your collection process. So Clarison has the opportunity for us to capture lessons learned on a project basis and kind of really roll those up so we can have meaningful discussions. Yeah, and it's really easy to tie value to these because you can you can demonstrate that in Clarism when you capture lesson learned, it's not just something that floats out there and gets forgotten. It, you you can assign an owner, you can put some governance on and say, if I create a lesson learned, then you can assign somebody a practice or a manager who owns that, and they're responsible for getting that thing done. You can create an action plan around that, whether it's updating templates or you know uh, sorting out processes, whatever it is. You make these action oriented, and it falls into the queue of all the other work that you have because that's what should happen with your lessons learned. It shouldn't just get forgotten or lost on some spreadsheet somewhere. Another key uh, soft benefit is really team satisfaction. I mean, from a team perspective, you're going to make everybody's life better if you centralize this in Clarison instead of continuing to have them struggle with you know sheets over here or spreadsheets over there. I worked recently with a team where they have SAP. And if you've got SAP in your organization or a big complicated ERP, you know it can be really tough to manage those because you get the data that comes out of it and that's it and you have to deal with it. By integrating that, you can have an automatic stream that pulls the key financial data directly into Clarison. And, and now as a project manager, I don't have to pull all these weird Z reports out of SAP. I go straight in the, right into uh, Clarison and I can see all that data there in context with my project that makes my life so much easier and lets me focus on what I need to get done. And finally, one last thing we'll touch on here because we are, boy, time's going fast, uh, is customer or stakeholder satisfaction. And going back to our PPM data consumption survey I talked about earlier, one of the really interesting findings that we came out of that was that organizations that have a high, and this is, it was correlated a high level of process compliance. Of all the things we measured, process compliance had the highest correlation with the ability to close out a project successfully. In fact, those organizations that reported a high level of process compliance in their org had a four times, a 4x better ability to get projects done and done on time, which of course results in higher customer satisfaction. And what this tells us, tells us is that if you have the centralized tool, if you have the ability to automate process, provide data validation, and keep track of what's going on in your projects and your portfolio, that really does make sense because that's going to translate into the ability to get things done if everybody's doing what they're, what they're supposed to and if you can identify any outliers or any exceptions to those processes. And so I appreciate that was a – oh, go ahead, Matt. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so – um, just to wrap up on soft costs, there's, that's a lot that I threw at you, but uh, soft costs, you will have to invest a little more of your own time in digging down into them, understanding, uh, trying to figure out how you can quantify those values or explain those benefits in a soft way to your stakeholders. And I would recommend, again, keeping that offline conversation if you can, say, hey, we really think we can gain a lot through, in this case, stakeholder satisfaction and get some benefit out of that. So how can we best um, describe that or communicate that to the investment team? And that it's a little more difficult, a little more work, but it can take you really, really far. 
Thanks, Kim. So we've had a great review so far of the strategic benefits and hard and cost savings that you will need to consider for your justification and business case. Uh, but how do we ensure that you're talking to the, the, about the right benefits to the right people? So we're going to categorize common stakeholders into three groups, finance, HR resource, and management executives. Note that it is really important, super critical here that you need to tailor your message. Messages that don't re resonate with a particular stakeholder group are just noise and can potentially defocus your message. Yeah, and I like to call this a rabbit hole of details, <laughs> right? I think most, many of us have already been there. It can really throw you off track when you're trying to go through your business case, especially with the busy executives who might not be up to speed on progress. So wrong, questionable, or too much data on your slides is too much data is really bad, uh, can really derail a high-level conversation that you plan to have with your executive. So Start broad like a funnel, start at a high level, and then zero in on the specifics from there. And I always recommend that you keep a few just-in-case backup slides. If you really feel the need to keep some data or justification in the details, create the slide, put it at the back of your slide deck in backup slides. Don't present those unless you get specific questions. And further, one of my favorite conversations I like to have with the finance team is, is how, they, how they struggle with project financials. If you can provide direct benefit to the finance team, it can, and if you can make their lives easier and give them more accurate financials, or if you're able to put their financials into your projects more accurately so you can manage your projects better, faster, and with less admin, the finance team has a lot of sway in funding your projects in most organizations. So specifically, anything where you can demonstrate the ability to have improved project budget management, especially forecasting. Now, if you're professional services, this is number one, and in itself can sell your PPM investment if you can demonstrate that you can forecast better. Uh, and if you can demonstrate that your forecasting is going to be more timely, you can get it out, and it doesn't take you hours, days, or weeks to get out forecasts, and you can be more responsive to questions. And more importantly, if you can be more accurate, that can go a long way to justifying your investment. Of course, data accuracy and transparency are very important, and being able to provide direct access to the PPM for self-service, it's a brand new thing for a lot of organizations so that they, your finance team can go in and see where the forecasts are right now, and so they can um, also keep the PMs in, in loop in real time as well as uh, financials are updated from your ERP. And of course, more accurate data is vital, which brings us back around to automation and simplification. Flipping that back around to the project managers, if they're going to be able to forecast and manage their projects better, if they can get direct access into financials, kind of like the SAP use case I mentioned earlier. So if we can automate, bring in financial data into Clarison, then put it all in one place, your actual resource costs, your actual invoices that are recognized for each item that you're spending money on, timesheets, travel expenses, if you can get all those pulled in automatically into your Clarison instance, it gives your project managers the power to make accurate financial forecasts and also maybe identify um, where you might be going off risk ahead of time instead of trying to put out the fire later. It can help you avoid a lot of firefighting, and this can bring us back around to our single source of truth again. We talked about transparency um, and accurate data earlier. The more you can automate, the more work you can do in a single system, the more accurate your data will be, and the easier it is for everybody. And those are the kinds of benefits from a tool that can really help you sell it. The bottom line is if you can get your finance assurance that they're going to be getting better financial data, more accurate forecasting, and more timely information, that can put you in a really strong position to get their support on your business case. Heck, they might even just buy it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really important, Kim, exactly. So from an HR and resource management perspective, we want to think about resource alignment. It's really important to really understand what your resources are working on, what they're doing. Are they working on something important to your business, uh, for example, strategic initiatives? Are they improving quality or reducing costs? We want to make sure that resources are providing the maximum value to the company, both short-term and long-term. And we're really talking about people when we talk about resources. Um, and so you think about, again, if they're utilized per, um, the right way on the right initiatives, you're looking at uh, potentially increasing team satisfaction, especially if you're using a tool like Clarison where you can uh, automate different things like status reports and stuff like that, and also use one tool for essentialized data. Um, it gives the opportunity for the PMs to really manage uh, that data and communicate that data. So, you know, we've all been there. I've been there where you're working on a Friday night, uh, and before you go home, you can get your status report ready. Um, you know, using Claris and you push one button, you're done. And you can go home on time and see your family. It's really important. So the bottom line here really is that the HR resource management wants to know what people are working on and that they have the proper balance of capacity to support initiatives that are important to the business. 
It's it's so true. Um, and you can. This is also. There's no better way to manage headcount justification than having that data at the ready and being able to show this is where you're overutilized. This is where you're underutilized. Exactly. And so, so lastly, we're talking um, about executive stakeholders. Yeah, let's do that. So we're getting short on time, but let me touch on executive stakeholders. And this, we talked about this at the beginning, and this is a group that needs very precise, tailored business cases uh, written for them or very specific language. We talked a lot about the benefits early on uh, around the strategic area because pretty much everything we've talked about touches on C-suite in some way. And there's a lot of information for very business business. Very, there's a lot of information that you want to convey to them. So when you talk to them, really if you can, again, please try to build that relationship in ahead of time. If you can, have a lead conversation, take them to coffee, and really focus on not what you want to do from a technical perspective, but focus on what they want to do to succeed. And really look for those words. Try to use their words in your business case, and that will really help you out a lot. Shall we uh, circle back around to some key points? Yeah, I think so. Um, so key points messaging through this webinar. So um, things to think about, right? So a good PPM solution like Clarizing is an investment in your future success. You really got to start by getting the lay of the land, understand what your organization, again, what they invest in, you know, what the criteria you're looking for, and really learn from the past. You know, benefits come in many forms, hard, soft, strategic. Uh, find the areas that will resonate with each business area and the stakeholders you're working with and really target that. Start from the top down. Look at the strategic benefits to your organization and work from there. Uh, hard costs can be hard to identify, um, but are very important to business case and they're really taken pretty seriously. Soft savings are hard to quantify as well, uh, but provide a really big benefit to investment. And like Kim said, do the rabbit hole of details. You want the right level of detail that will communicate the message to the people you're talking to. You don't want too much detail to defocus the message. You know, those backup slides are, you know, something I often use. It's a great benefit that if you need to, you can get to the detail you need. But otherwise, keep the messages as high level as you can. Absolutely. And that's a whole, we gave you so much content today. And that's, you know, that's just really touching the service. And it's a lot to think about. And so, um, if you want some help putting together your business story, Matt and I are such nerds about this. And we've done this for a lot of organizations, and we love doing it so much that uh, we've got a cheat sheet that we're going to give give you access to that you can download. And what's more for that, for, uh, we'll also give you access. If you'd like to book some time with us, you're really interested in digging down to this, we'll actually make our time available to you. So uh, we'll give you a link that you can sign up and book a little bit of time for us. Um, so, Lori, I think we've taken up all the time, but I'll, I'll hand back to you and, and thanks so much. And that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't hesitate to reach out to Matt and Kim. I know they'd love to hear from you. And check the description for that link to our free one pager. Thank you from everyone here at Colmy Group.